Hello and welcome to Fridays with Vistage. I'm your moderator, Lori Allen. We have an interesting guest with an important topic today. Asset protection for the business owner. Learn how to protect everything you own from everyone, every time. But first, this reminder, the slides and other resources from today's presentation will be sent to you midweek next week. Our presenter is Hillel Presser. He's got an MBA. He's an author. He's an attorney. He's president of the Presser Law Firm. He's been featured in major publications, and he's written three books that you can see on your screen. I like that financial self-defense. That is a clever title. Here's something that you will love about Hillel. He is like you. He is a Vistage member, but he's also a Vistage speaker. So if you like what you hear today, he'd appreciate you telling your chair. The Presser Law Firm helps business owners protect their hard-earned assets from lawyers, malpractice claims, creditors, foreclosure deficiencies, former or current spouses, children, relatives, and lawsuit-obsessed citizens. Hillel, take it away. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Today we're going to talk about asset protection. We're going to talk about how do you literally protect everything you own from everyone every time. You know, we're all business owners. We all work very hard for our assets uh, to provide a good life for our for family. And we want to make sure that, you know, one lawsuit, one creditor can't take all of that away. So the first thing we'll do today is just give a little bit of a foundation and background information regarding asset protection. And I think that's so important. You know, we'll talk about what is asset protection. Uh, why is asset protection so important? Uh, why is liability insurance not enough? Uh, as soon as we lay a foundation, we'll go right into uh, a couple different asset protection uh, techniques and tactics. So literally, we'll talk about how do you protect everything you own from everyone every time. Uh, after that, we'll talk a little bit about international asset protection, which deals with planning strategies outside the United States. And we'll also talk about some common additional asset protection strategies as well. So without further ado, let's get started. Next slide, please. Next. The first thing that I always get asked is why I became an asset protection attorney. And as far back as I can remember, if you would have asked me when I was 10 years old what I was going to be, I would have told you hands down that I was going to be an attorney. Uh, it probably had something to do with the fact that at that point I was very close with my uncle Jimmy. And Jimmy was one of the first personal injury attorneys to ever advertise on TV. And while I knew him as Jimmy, the majority of uh, the country knew him as Jim the Hammer Shapiro. And he'd get on TV and scream at his top of his lungs, um, Jim, the hammer, Shapiro. I'll ring out every penny, squeeze out every dime. You don't have to like me, just make sure you call me. I may be an SOB, but I'm your SOB. You call, I hammer. And I want to take uh, just about 30 seconds to show and show you uh, one of his commercials. Next slide, please. Hurt? I cannot rip out the hearts of those who hurt you. I cannot hand you their severed heads. But I can hunt them down and settle the score. I'll squeeze them for every dime I can. Every single dime. I'm Jim the Hammer Shapiro. But I cannot proceed until you call. 1-800-546-7777. You call, I hammer. Now, I don't show you this uh, because I'm proud of Jimmy. I show you this because this was 30 years ago. Uh, today, this is the norm. Today, it's every bus bench, who can I sue? Every radio and TV ad, who can I sue? You know, the lawyers are trying to figure out how can we take the money out of the pockets of the hardworking business owners and redistribute the wealth, of course, taking about 33 to 40% uh, for their own pockets uh, while they go. So. What is asset protection? Asset protection is the legal process of titling both your personal and business assets to put them beyond the reach of future potential threats and creditors. And what we do as asset protection attorneys is we help our clients protect any asset they have from any financial threat. 
So the assets might be as simple as checking, savings, stock, bond, brokerage accounts. It might be real estate, shares in a corporation, membership interest in an LLC, even intellectual property like trademarks, domains, phone numbers, or even inheritances. And we want to make sure that they're protected against any financial threat, which of course in today's day and age mostly means lawsuits, creditors, short sale or foreclosure deficiencies, uh, divorce, car accidents, judgments, anything that could take away what you worked your whole life so hard to obtain. So a lot of people say, well, do I have enough assets to protect? And the short answer is yes. You know, everybody needs some sort of asset protection plan. Uh, we represent a, a lot of uh, professional athletes, maybe, I don't know, 40 or 50 uh, NFL and NBA players. And I always like to give the comparison. You know, take one of my NFL playing clients who signs a deal for $50 million. Well, if they get sued for $5 million, they're not going to be happy, but they still have $45 million left. Contrast that with the everyday person who might have saved up a couple hundred thousand dollars over their career. Well, if they get sued for a million dollars, they're going to be wiped out. It's catastrophic, and there's no coming back from that. So the less you have, the more you actually need protection, obviously not to the same degree. And a lot of people say, well, what if I already have an asset protection plan? And if you do, I think that's great. You know, just like you get an annual physical every year, you should get a financial physical every year because the laws change. Also, we see a lot of big misconceptions. Probably one of the biggest misconceptions I see is somebody will walk into my office with a trust, and that trust is technically called a domestic revocable or living trust. Um, and it's a great estate planning tool, but it doesn't do anything from an asset protection point of view. So a lot of people think that their assets are protected because they have trust set up when, in all fairness, there's no asset protection, just great estate planning. So why do you need asset protection? And I always show this cute little cartoon. Uh, it's two lawyers talking. One says, I say Sue. The other one says, anyone in particular. And I always get a few smiles and laughs when I show this. But unfortunately, this is the truth. Just like you guys as Vistage members and just like myself as a Vistage member, you know, we're smart enough to get together once a month, help each other with personal and business problems. However, uh, the lawyers are getting together, but they're getting together every single day or every single week. And they're saying, who are we going to sue next? Is it going to be the business owners, the car manufacturers, the financial advisors? Who's next? There's 100 million lawsuits every single year, and that number is only growing. In today's bad economy, people are losing their jobs. The people who are keeping their jobs are making less and less. Why not go to any corner, hire an attorney for free on a contingency basis, and sue? costs you nothing but 20 or 30 minutes of your time, and if you win, a lot of times it's tax-free money. You know, unfortunately, lawsuits have truly become the next biggest business. There's a one in four chance you will be sued in the next 12 months. The average person and business is sued five times over their lifetime. So if you have an LLC or an S-Corp, on average you're sued five times, on average your company is sued five times. Now these are just the stats. We have clients that have never been sued. We have clients that get sued every single month. It just depends what type of work you're in, how many employees do you have, do you have five employees or 5,000 employees, etc. There's a 50% chance of divorce, and a lawsuit can cost you tens of thousands of dollars even if you win the case. And this is so important. You know, it is so easy and inexpensive to file a lawsuit if not free. You know, you can hire any attorney for free on a contingency fee basis. The problem is, is if you get sued, even if it's a frivolous lawsuit, it's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, to defend the case. So, unfortunately, the trick is not making money, it's keeping it. And the challenge I give always to all the different Vistage members that I speak to is that for every 60 minutes you spend making money, spend 60 seconds thinking about how to protect it. So a lot of people say, well, what about insurance? You know, I have insurance. Isn't that enough? And I think insurance is great. Uh, you know, I tell my clients, buy as much insurance as you can because it's cheap and it helps you sleep at night. But at the end of the day, don't rely on insurance. You need to understand that insurance are for-profit companies. Uh, about 70% of lawsuits are not covered by insurance. You know, my father always used to say, uh, whenever you get an insurance policy, there's always about a half of a page of what's covered and about 50 pages of what's not covered. You know, the big print giveth, the small print taketh away. Your coverage may be inadequate. What if you have 100 or 200 or 300 thousand dollars in coverage on your car? but you're sued for a million dollars. 
You know, who do you think has to come out of pocket for the rest? And while we're talking about cars, I just want to tell you, any car that you have that you drive should only be in the name of the driver. So if you have a car that you drive and you're the husband, the car should only be in your name. If your wife has a car that she drives, the car should only be in her name. If your kids have a car that they drive, the car should only be in their name. I had a general contractor who came in, a uh, real nice guy. His uh, son, who was 16, was driving his car. So the son was driving the father's car, and the car was in the father's name. Uh, the son wasn't speeding. He wasn't drinking. Uh, it was wet outside, and he actually slipped and hit a pedestrian. Uh, the pedestrian had about a million dollars in medical bills, and they only had about $100,000 of insurance. Because the son was driving the father's car in the father's name, the father was able to be sued. Uh, if, there, if ever there's a car accident, there's two parties that can be sued, the driver and the owner. Well, the son obviously was, could be sued as the driver, but he doesn't have much, and the father could be sued as the owner. Well, the father is now going to be bankrupt because – the son got in the accident. So he didn't even do anything wrong, but the mere fact that the car was in his name caused him all that liability. Your insurance company might go bankrupt. If I would have said that 10 years ago, you would have kicked me out of the room. Today we have banks and Fortune 500 companies going out of business. Who's to say that the insurance companies won't be next? Also, insurance doesn't cover other uninsured financial risks and divorce. And I actually need to change my presentation. I was Googling, and there's actually one company now that offers divorce insurance. Uh, who knows what they'll think of next? You know, if you get a divorce, they pay you. Uh, but they won't pay you until the divorce is finalized because they don't want the money to become a marital asset. So insurance alone is not the answer. You need your own asset protection plan to supplement your insurance. I call it the belt and suspenders approach. You want as many layers and as many firewalls as possible. You want to make it so difficult, so expensive, if not impossible, for anybody to collect against you that they don't even want to sue you in the first place. You don't want to be the low-hanging fruit. So the three maxims of asset protection, number one, protect yourself before you have a problem. You know, you can't buy car insurance after the car accident. You know, your estate can't buy life insurance after you pass away. Uh, before Obamacare, you couldn't buy medical insurance after you got sick. Asset protection is a proactive planning. You know, it's the legal process of titling both your personal and business assets to put them beyond the reach of future potential threats and creditors. So you always want to make sure that everything you're doing is totally proactive. You also want to start with a basic plan and add firewalls as needed. I can't tell you how many times someone will read one of the books that I authored on asset protection, and they'll call in and say, I want a personal international asset protection Swiss hybrid trust. And I'll literally spend an hour explaining to them why they don't need it. You want to start very small. You want to start very inexpensive. As your personal and business assets grow, your plan can grow. As your education grows, your plan can grow. But you don't want to try and do everything at once because you need to understand every single thing that you're doing. Also, and this is most importantly, don't look for one magic bullet or one uh, size fits all plans. Asset protection is not cookie cutter. Uh, everybody's personal and business assets are different. Everybody's potential threats, creditors, and liabilities are different. So it might work for you, might not work for me, and vice versa. You need an individualized and customized and tailored plan that fits your asset protection needs. A lot of mistakes to avoid. Today we're going to talk about just the five killer mistakes. Number one, hiding your assets. Asset protection is not about hiding. It's not about secrecy. It's about protection. I tell all my clients that at some point you're probably going to have to disclose what you own and where it is. Because if you lose a lawsuit, they're going to sit you down for a deposition under oath, and if they ask you the right questions, well, you need to ask, answer them honestly and ethically. And asset protection, with a good asset protection plan, you should be able to tell every single creditor what you have and where it is. They just shouldn't be able to get to it. So a good asset protection plan should not deal with hiding your assets or secrecy. You never want to title your assets to straws. I can't make up these stories. People come into my office and say, oh, don't worry, Mr. Presser, uh, I'm being sued, but I gave everything to my best friend. You know, what actually makes you think that your best friend has less legal and financial troubles than you? I can't make these stories up. I had a client come in, he, had, he was being sued, and he had given all of his assets to his best friend. The best friend got a divorce, and the best friend's wife ended up taking the client's assets in the divorce. You never want to title all your assets to your spouse. We see this the most with our doctor and physician and surgeon clients. They always say, oh, well, you know, they're the less vulnerable spouse. 
And that may be true, but let me tell you something. Nobody's immune to a lawsuit. You know, nobody gets up in the morning and expects to be sued. You know, your wife can just as easily get in a car accident taking the kids to soccer practice. You never want to commit fraudulent transfers. This deals with trying to protect yourself after the fact. All asset protection planning should always be proactive. And most importantly, you never want to break any laws. You know, our law firm, we have a nationwide practice, and we do both domestic and international asset protection. You know, there's nothing wrong with having international trusts or foreign LLCs or offshore bank accounts. There's something very wrong with having them and not reporting them to the government, the Treasury Department, the IRS. So no matter what your asset protection plan is, you always want to make sure that you're doing everything legal and ethical uh, to make sure that uh, you know, you're not breaking any laws. So four basic strategies. In the middle, we have exposed wealth. And if you have anything in your personal name, it's exposed. So if you have a checking, savings, stock, bond, brokerage account, if it's in your personal name, it is exposed wealth. If you have real estate, primary residence, rental real estate, boats, cars, planes, shares in corporations, whether they're S-Corps or C-Corps, membership interests in LLCs, if you have anything in your name, it is exposed wealth. And the reason it's exposed is if it's in your name, if somebody sues you, they can take it and you can lose it. So anything that's in your personal name is 0% protected, 100% unprotected. And the first thing I try and tell my clients is stop worrying about ownership. You know, the key to asset protection is to own nothing but control everything. I don't want to own anything because if you own it, you can lose it. All I care about is who gets the benefit. You know, you really don't own anything. You might think you own your house, but if you really think about it, you really just have a long-term lease on it. You know, you can't take it with you. The Egyptians tried and it didn't work. So stop worrying about who owns it. Start worrying about who gets the benefit of it. Because if it's in your name and you own it, it is exposed, which means you can lose it all. So lots of things you can do to protect yourself. Let's talk about the four most common today. Number one, transferring your assets to a protective entity. You know, uh, just like you and I are different people with different Social Security numbers, if I get sued, they can't come after you. If you get sued, they can't come after me. No difference between you and your protective entity. There's tons of different types of protective entities. There's LLCs, limited partnerships, corporations, trusts, et cetera, et cetera, and they go on and on. Well, you have a Social Security number, and your protective entity has a different tax ID number. The law looks at you as two separate individuals. So let's take a very simple example. You have a brokerage account, checking, saving, stocks, bonds, etc., with $500,000 in it, and it's in your personal name. Well, like we talked about, that's exposed wealth. You can lose all $500,000. Why not take the $500,000 and put it into some sort of protective entity, maybe a limited partnership? Now, if you get sued, they can't take one penny. You can still bank anywhere you want to bank, invest in anything you want to invest in, use any financial advisor that you want. But by taking the name out of your name, by taking the asset out of your name where it's exposed and you can lose it and putting it into a protective entity, you've totally protected the asset. Another strategy is protecting with liens. You know, poverty is power, and the first thing a lawyer will probably do before he sues you is look you up to see what you have. Well, you might have a house, and you might not want a mortgage. Well, why not get a line of credit? You know, if somebody searches you, it still shows up as a mortgage, uh, showing that you're not a good candidate for a lawsuit. But if you don't pull from the line of credit, it doesn't cost you anything. You know, if you put money into your business, whether it's for marketing, equipment, staff, etc., why not file a lien, a UCC, a mortgage, an encumbrance against your business? You know, if your business fails, why shouldn't you be the first creditor in line? I'll give you an example. Um, I have a client, and every year he buys a brand new Ferrari, and these are expensive. He might spend four or five hundred thousand dollars on the Ferrari. Well, what we did this year is obviously he has no exposed wealth. None of the money is in his personal name; otherwise, somebody can take it. All of his money is in the protective entity, like we talked about. So he took the money, the four or $500,000 from the protective entity, and he sent it to the Ferrari dealership, and he bought his Ferrari. Immediately, the protective entity filed a lien against the Ferrari. Now he's driving a four or $500,000 Ferrari. It's totally paid off, but there's a lien on the Ferrari. So if he gets sued, nobody can take the car. And now you're starting to see how we layer and firewall our strategies. Instead of keeping the money or the car and exposed wealth in your personal name where you can lose it, 
We've put the money in the protective entity. We've then used the money from the protective entity to buy the car, and then we've used the protective entity to place a lien against the car. So now we're starting to layer and firewall our strategies. Another strategy is to only own exempt assets. Exempt assets just mean what assets are protected by your state law. And every state protects different assets. Um, if you go to our website, it's, it's very simple. It's www.assetprotectionattorneys.com. You can actually see every single state. So if you click on your state, you, you can see what's protected. And we have a whole slide that's coming up about this, so we'll go into more detail in a few minutes about this. And lastly, transfer all ownership rights. This deals with if you own shares in an S-Corp or shares in a C-Corp or membership interest in an LLC, you want to get that out of your name. So again, just to briefly recap, because this is the most important slide, anything that's in your personal name is exposed wealth. If you get sued, somebody can take it. You want to have absolutely nothing in your personal name. One strategy is to take it out of your name and put it into some sort of protective entity where it's protected. If you get sued, they cannot come after the protective entity. Another strategy is to protect it with liens, UCCs, mortgages, encumbrances, to make all of your assets look valueless. Another strategy is to convert it into an exempt asset, which is some sort of asset that's protected by state law. And last strategy is, again, own nothing, control everything. Get all those shares of the corporation and membership interest in the LLC out of your name so no one can touch your business. So let's talk about exemption laws. Exemption laws are just what's protected in your state. And I'm talking today, to you today from sunny Boca Raton, Florida, so I'm just going to tell you what's protected uh, in Florida. Uh, your homestead in Florida is protected. That means your primary house in Florida is protected. You can have a $500,000 house, a $5 million house, a $50 million house. doesn't matter. In Florida, your house is protected against creditors and lawsuits. Pension and qualified plans, non-qualified plans, certain personal property and wages. In Florida, all of your retirement plans are protected, so your 401Ks, your IRAs, etc. Annuities are protected in Florida, and life insurance is protected in Florida. Now, again, if you go to our website at www.assetprotectionattorneys.com, on the left-hand corner there's something called financial planning exemptions. You can look at your state and see what's protected and what's not. So just to give you a little contrast, you know, in Florida, your primary house is protected. It doesn't matter how much it's worth. In New York, depending what county you live in, it's only protected anywhere from about 75000 up to about 150000 In New Jersey, it's not protected at all. You know, in Florida, your life insurance is protected. Well, in Georgia, it's only protected up to about $4,000. So you want to see what's protected in your state. So if you're in a state that uh, protects your homestead, your primary house, it might be a good strategy to pay off your mortgage. If you're in a state like New York that might only protect seventy five dollars to $150,000 worth of equity, well, I wouldn't want to pay off my mortgage in New York because that's an asset that a creditor can go after. So you want to find out what's protected in your state, and based on what's protected, you might want to make some decisions of how you should structure your investments. Co-ownership, okay? There's something called tenancy by entirety that exists in about 25 different states, and it's great. Here's the thing. It's only for a married couple. It's for a husband and wife who's living. If there's a divorce, you can't do it. If there's a death, you can't do it. But for the 25 states where you are married, this is a great level of protection. It doesn't cost you anything. Everybody should be doing it. Here's how it works. The way tenancy by entirety works is as follows. Let's say a husband has $100,000 in his account and he's sued. Well, the creditor can take it all. Let's say the wife has $100,000 in her account, and she sued. Well, the creditor can take it all. With tenancy by entirety, if the husband would have took his 100000 and the wife would have took her 100000 and put it in one account and labeled it properly, tenancy by entirety, well, if the husband sued, they can't take a penny. If the wife sued, they can't take a penny. The only time they can even try and go after the asset is if both the husband and the wife are sued, which is very rare. You know, usually the, the husband or the wife work in the business and they're sued, or usually there's a, a car accident and it's either the husband or the wife who's been sued. So just to recap, they have tenancy by entirety in about 25 different states. It's only for spouses, husband and wife. There's survivorship rights, so it's great for estate planning. If the husband dies, the assets go to the, to the to wife. If the wife dies, the, hu the assets go to the husband. Uh, there's safety when only one spouse is sued. 
But like we talked about, there's immediate exposure upon one spouse's death or divorce. And again, if you go to our website, you could take a look and see, you know, do they have tenancy by entirety in your state? It's only in about 25 different states. Of course, Florida does have it. Um, you know, Florida is a great place to live if you want to be a debtor, hence why probably OJ and a lot of people uh, else moved here. I want to talk briefly about corporations because it's probably the biggest misconception I see. And this goes for anybody who has an S Corp or anybody who has a C Corp. And if you have one of these, you're probably going to hate me in a minute, but I want to give you the best legal advice. You know, why does anybody set up a corporation uh, or business entity, whether it's an S Corp, a C Corp, or LLC? Well, they set it up because they want to make sure that, God forbid, the business is sued, that nobody can come after their personal assets. And that's why anybody sets up any type of corporation or business entity. And in most cases, that works, and corporations do the trick. The problem is, is that people never think about it the other way around. Whenever I ask people, what's your most valuable asset, their response is always, my business. And the reason why it's the most valuable asset is the business is what supports everything else. We use the money from the business to uh, you know, pay for our mortgage, to pay for our cars, to pay for our lifestyle. So the one thing that we can't afford to lose is the business. Well, unfortunately, you know, if your company is an S-Corp, you're putting yourself at risk, and here's why. You know, let's say you're sued for $100,000, and you have $100,000 in the bank. Well, I can easily take that $100,000 in the bank. Let's say you're sued for $100,000, and you have $100,000 in Facebook or Apple stock. Well, no difference than the 100000 in the bank. Now it's in the form of Facebook or Apple stock. It's just another form of asset. As a creditor, I can take that asset. Well, no difference if you own shares in your S-Corp or C-Corp. Let's say you're sued. I can go after the shares that you own in your S-Corp. And if I own more than 50%, well, now I'm a majority shareholder. I can vote anywhere I want, hire, fire, liquidate the bank, bankrupt the company, I've seen companies that have been around for, you know, 50-plus years go out of business, not because anything happens to the business, but because the owner or majority owner of the business, the majority owner of that S-Corp or C-Corp is sued. Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's a car accident. Maybe it's a slip and fall. Maybe it's a property that went bad, and the creditor takes the shares in the corporation. So if you have an S-Corp, if you have a C-Corp, you certainly want to uh, relook at those things. And there's a lot of different things you can do to easily fix it, but you just want to know that those options are available. So, you know, corporations are great to protect yourself against business debts. We know that. But they're terrible to protect your personal assets, a.k.a. the shares in the corporation. I also like to talk to people about separating business assets. You know, you don't ever want to have your business directly own assets. Whenever I talk to someone and I meet them and we start talking about business, I ask them how many companies they have. And normally someone will tell me that they have one operating company. And that really scares me because if you have all of your assets in an operating company, cash, accounts receivables, trademarks, domains, phone numbers, cars, you know, all the assets of your business, well, that's great when your business is doing fine. But what if your business is ever sued by a customer, an employee, uh, anybody? Well, if they sue your business, they can take any asset of your business. So I never like the operating business to directly own any of the assets. What you want to do is you want to separate each asset associated with the business and maybe have some sort of leasing strategy. Let me give you an example. Uh, we worked with a club in Miami, and let's just pretend that everybody thinks of this club uh, and the name is Club LLC. So Club LLC is equivalent to your operating company. Club LLC owns absolutely nothing, just like your operating company owns apps should own absolutely nothing. We then set up four or five other companies. We set up a separate company to own the furniture. We set up a separate company to own the liquor license. We set up a separate company to own the lease. We set up a separate company to own the stereo equipment. And what we did is all those separate companies on a month-to-month -month basis leased those assets to Club LLC. Well, God forbid something happens at Club LLC and somebody drinks too much and leaves and you know, gets in a car accident and sues the club. The club doesn't own anything. So if they're sued, there's nothing for them to get. They can open up a new company, let's call it The Club LLC, the very next day, and they can restart by releasing all those assets in separate companies. So your operating company should never have any assets. All of the assets should be in separate companies and should be leased to your operating company. There's too big of a chance with your operating company that they're going to be sued at some point to leave all your assets in there. 
I want to make sure that, God forbid, your operating company is sued, you can open up a new company the very next day and not lose a moment's sleep. I want to talk briefly about uh, international asset protection. And instead of just going uh, through everything, I'm going to tell you essentially what you would have to do you know, if you wanted to uh, go after one of our clients who have uh, properly and proactively set up international asset protection. Well, the first thing you'd have to do is sue the client in the U.S. Because unless it's a very specific case, a lot of times the clients don't even have to disclose what assets they have unless they lose the case. So you first have to sue the client and beat them in the U.S. After that, you have to sit them down for a deposition, and you need to know what questions to ask regarding international asset protection, which, to be honest with you, very few people know what questions to ask. But let's say they know exactly what to ask. We already talked about it. Asset protection is not about hiding. It's not about secrecy. It's about protection. So, of course, you'll tell them what you've set up. And let's say you've set up an international trust in the Cook Islands. Um, and I'm just going to use the Cook Islands as an example. I think there's better places, but uh, there was a big Wall Street Journal article about it, so we'll use that as an example. Uh, typically, when I set up an international trust, I'll set it up in at least two to three countries at the same time just to make it more difficult and expensive on a creditor. But for today's example, let's just use a trust in the Cook Islands. Well, the first thing the uh, creditor would have to do is go to the Cook Islands. And it's very tough to get there. I'm not sure exactly now, but last time I checked, there was, I think, one flight that left uh, you know, on a Sunday night or something from California, and it was a 14-hour flight. So pretty much you're stuck there for a week. Uh, once you get there, you then need to hire counsel because they don't US, enforce U.S. judgments, so you have to relitigate your entire case. Well, there's not that many attorneys on the Cook Islands, so there's a good chance that they might be conflicted off the case which means the creditor might need to fly to the nearest country, you know, maybe six hours plus or minus to New Zealand to find an attorney there. Well, in Florida or New York or California, it would be very easy to find an attorney. You know, they take the case on a contingency fee. But in New Zealand and the Cook Islands, there's no contingency fees. So now you're paying your New Zealand attorney, potentially a U.S. attorney hourly, to fly him back and forth to the Cook Islands. So now you're in the Cook Islands and you're ready to sue. Well, depending on what country you use, there's a very short statute of limitations. That means how long does the creditor have to sue? So, for example, if there's a car accident in Florida, you have four years to sue. Well, depending on which international jurisdiction we use, the creditor has anywhere from zero to two years to sue. So a lot of times they can't even sue because the U.S. case has taken a lot longer than the two years. If it's within the statute of limitation, you know, we want to argue that the creditor is going to have to post a bond, maybe two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, because if they lose, they have to pay your attorney's fees. You know, the amount of evidence needed in the U.S. is 51 percent of the evidence. Uh, internationally, depending on the jurisdiction, a lot of times it's beyond a reasonable doubt. That's 99.9 percent. You know, you would need more proof to go after a client's money than they had to put Casey Anthony in jail for murder. There's no punitive damages, which means if it's a car accident, you may be able to collect the damage to fix the car or the hospital bills, but never the big amount, the pain and suffering. And any good asset protection attorney is going to put what I refer to as a Cuba or a flea clause, which allows the trustee to relocate the assets at any point. So while you're suing them in the Cook Islands, they've already moved everything to Nevis or Belize or Switzerland or a whole different country, and the creditor has to do everything all over again. The point is it is so difficult, so expensive, if not impossible, to win against an international entity, most people won't even try it. They don't have the money. It could cost them millions of dollars to go after you. Uh, in fact, I think the last, the last time I checked, uh, the stats were somewhere between, I don't know, 1% or 2% uh, of all international asset protection entities were challenged. Not beaten, but challenged. So for people who have a lot of liquid assets, international asset protection is essential. I just want to talk very briefly about captive insurance. I mean, we could talk for hours uh, about captive insurance. Uh, captive insurance has been around for a long time, I don't know, maybe 60, 70 years, uh, and I think about 85% of Fortune 500 companies uh, have a captive insurance company. Uh, a captive insurance company is really no different than a regular insurance company, except the difference is the client owns it. Well, what's the great thing about insurance? The great thing about insurance is that, you know, when you pay your insurance bill, it's a tax deduction. Also, the great thing about insurance is if you have a claim, hopefully they pay. What's the terrible thing about insurance? Well, if you write a check and you have no claim, you've wasted the money. So with a captive insurance company, you fix that problem. Since you own the captive insurance company, well, if there are no claims, everything becomes profit to you. 
And essentially, you have to be very careful with these things. Um, you know, they're very uh, uh, difficult to set up. They could take, you know, easily four, five, six months, and you have to do things right. You have to cross all the T's and dot all the I's uh, because a lot of legal and ethical things that go involved to them. But take a business that's doing, you know, $30 million uh, gross, and let's say that uh, they have uh, $28.5 million in expenses. Well, they're netting a million five. If they have a captive insurance company, uh, the captive insurance company can write insurance from the insurance company to the operating business. Now, again, this is all real stuff. There has to be real insurable interest. You need third-party actuaries, underwriters, inspecting the business, interviewing the key employees, the tax returns, and you can't just make up any insurance. This has to be real insurance. And I don't know if it will be you know, loss of uh, key customer, technology malfunction, reputational harm, but it's all customizable insurance that might not be available on the open market, but, and if it was, would be very, very expensive. Well, the captive insurance company writes insurance to the operating business. So year one, the operating business is getting great insurance. Any money paid to the captive insurance company, of course, is a tax deduction because it's an ordinary and necessary business expense. So you have the tax deduction year one, and you have the insurance year one. The reason why I love these things is because from an asset protection point of view, it's a way to pull money out of your business so God forbid the business is ever sued, the creditor can't take the money. So you have the tax deduction year one because you're writing the check for the insurance. You have the insurance year one because the captive insurance company is supplying insurance to your business. And you have the asset protection because you've pulled money out of your business into the captive insurance company where it's protected. Now, the good thing about it is under IRS Code 831 subsection B, as long as the money that goes into the captive insurance company is under $1.2 million, um, it's actually uh, tax-free. Um, with this being said, of course, you still need to pay uh, you know, taxes when you take the money out. Um, depending on how you take it out, it might still come out as ordinary income, which means it's deferred. Uh, you could take it out as a loan. Again, it has to be a real loan, memorialized in writing, you know, uh, real interest rate. You really have to make the payments. Um, or a lot of times, you, know, you can take it out as cap gains. So there is potentially some tax savings there as well. Um, I would definitely urge you and caution you, although it does have great tax advantages, you definitely don't want to do it only for the tax advantage. You know, the IRS is cracking down on people who are doing that. You know, although it gives you those great tax advantages, you need to make sure, you know, that you're still getting the estate planning, the asset protection, uh, the insurance benefits, and that you truly have, you know, real and insurable risks. Just want to touch briefly on estate planning. Um, last time I checked, I think the stats were about seven out of uh, ten Americans died uh, without an estate plan. Uh, please go see your local estate planning attorney, put together a simple will, put together a simple trust. You know, if one thing in life is guaranteed, it's death. And unless you want your state telling you what to do with your assets, I suggest you put a plan together. You know, uh, everybody's going to die at some point. And, uh, you know, God forbid, even if you don't die, something happens to you. Who takes care of the kids? You know, who makes the financial decisions? Who makes the medical decisions? It's so important, guys, that you put some sort of estate planning uh, plan together. And the difference people always ask between asset protection and estate planning is really very easy. You know, estate planning deals with death. So estate planning deals with when you pass away, where do you want your assets to go? And certainly you want them, the assets to go there quickly, privately, and with the least amount of taxes that's legally and ethically possible. So estate planning deals with what happens to your assets when you die. On the contrary, asset protection deals with life. How do you protect all the assets that you have while you're alive? You know, you've worked so hard, you know, you don't want to be uh, retired backing out of your uh, driveway and hit a bicyclist and lose everything. You know, you don't want to have uh, one of your renters slip and fall at one of your uh, investment properties and lose everything. You don't want to have one of your kids driving one of your vehicles. The kid gets in a car accident and lose it, loses everything. So big differences between estate planning and asset protection. I also just want to touch really briefly on business succession planning. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, and this is kind of like estate planning for your business. You know, if anybody has a partner out there, I would urge you, urge you, you know, put together some sort of business succession plan. Because if you don't, here's what's going to happen. Let's say you have, uh, you know, two partners and all of a sudden, God forbid, one of the partners dies. Well, I don't think you want to go negotiate with the partner's wife or husband 
on what the value of the business is going to be. You know, the the living spouse might think the business is worth ten million. You're going to think it's worth you know three hundred thousand. Meanwhile, you're going to spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions, in attorneys' fees trying to figure out the value of the business. It could take two, three, four, five years. All the while, your business is being run to the ground and you're losing because of opportunity cost. So it's very simple ways that you can put together a business succession plan uh, where you have predetermined values of the business. And that way, God forbid, if one of the partners passes away, you know exactly the value of the business and there's no fighting with the spouse or the estate. Um, I know that uh, everything was brief today. Uh, you know, we just wanted to take about 45 minutes or so and talk to you about asset protection. I always like to end on a light note, and, and I'd really encourage you to stick around because we'll have a Q&A section at, at the end. Um, I put together a few of the 10 craziest lawsuits of last year. I don't know what happened to them, but these are real filed lawsuits. Number one, a couple sued an airline over a cockroach sighting. The couple stated that seeing cockroaches crawling out of air vents caused them great distress and forced them to throw away their luggage in fear of cockroach contamination. Number two, a Michigan woman sued a movie studio for not accurately portraying a movie in their trailers. She claimed it lacked fast and furious driving action as depicted in the movie trailer. I love this one. A fugitive, a fugitive sued his hostages for not helping him escape. He claimed that they promised to help him escape, and when they didn't, they breached an oral contract. A woman obtained walking directions that sent her down a highway. She went in the middle of the road and got hit by a car. She sued for bad directions. An employee sued for wrongful termination. The employee alleged that the company fired them because they helped customers during their lunch break instead of actually taking a break. Love this next one. Wedding couple sued a photographer over wedding photos that didn't come out right. 4000 as a refund, 48000 to restage the entire wedding. A customer sued for being overcharged for sausage by two cents and one. Anyone who has kids out there, be careful. Two children sued their mom for not spoiling them. The children claimed that she was a bad mother by requesting them be home by midnight, haggling over dress budgets, and failing to send them college care packages. The children sued the mom for $50,000. A woman sued a police department for allegedly making her listen to Rush Limbo's radio show while she was handcuffed in the back of the officer's car during the arrest. And number 10, I just spoke to uh, you know a huge group of vascular surgeons, uh, so I thought this was timely. A man divorced and sued his wife and won $120,000 because the wife had an ugly baby. Uh, he sued her for fraud. She had claimed that she was naturally beautiful, but she really had had about a half a dozen plastic surgeries. So you just never know. The point is we all work so hard for our money, whether it's to retire, you know, give more to our children or our spouses, to charity, whatever it may be, you know, for every 60 minutes you spend making money, we want to spend 60 seconds thinking about how to protect it. Again, I'm a Vistage member. I'm a Vistage presenter. You know, if you like what you heard today, uh, I'd be happy to present to your group uh, and do, a, you know, a three- to four-hour presentation. Um, I think at this time we'll turn the uh, conversation back over to the moderator, and uh, we'll open up uh, the floor for any questions, and I'd be happy to answer any and all questions. Hello. Thank you. This was eye-opening and thought-provoking. We appreciate it. But i got to ask, are those lawsuits really true, or do you make those up? No, I promise you, you can Google them. They are all real filed lawsuits. Now, what happened with them, whether they were settled, whether they were thrown out, you know, whether uh, you know, they won, that I can't tell you. But my point is this. You can file a lawsuit for anything, and it costs you nothing. You know, the attorney will take your case on a contingency fee basis, which means you pay nothing unless you win. Or even if you file the lawsuit yourself, it might cost you a couple hundred bucks to, follow, to file the lawsuit. Unfortunately, to defend the lawsuit will cost you tens, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. So while those all seem like very frivolous lawsuits, and I'd agree with you, they are, they're so easy and inexpensive, if not free to file, but so difficult and expensive to defend. Okay. Well, we do have some questions for you. The first one is, can I invest my money however I want if my assets are in a limited partnership? 
And the answer is yes. Um, essentially, a limited partnership is uh, just a type of protective entity, and it's a great protective entity, probably one of the best protective entities you can use to protect your liquid assets. So things like checking, savings, stocks, bonds, money markets, brokerage accounts. And we talked about it. If all of your liquid assets are in your personal name, you could lose every penny. If you would have taken those liquid assets and put them in a protective entity like a limited partnership, nobody can take those assets. And to answer the question specifically, those assets can be kept at any bank. You can invest in anything you want. You can use any financial advisor. So the only thing we're doing, the only thing that we're changing is we're layering it and wrapping it with this level of protection around the liquid assets. Okay. Uh, you talked a little bit about succession planning. Anything different for family-owned businesses? No different. I mean, family-owned businesses are probably the biggest ones that need succession planning, and here's why. I see it all the time. You know, let's take a family who have, uh, you know, a husband and wife, let's say they have three kids. Well, oftentimes you'll see that one of the three kids uh, is working uh, in the business, the other two are not. Well, when the father passes away, normally the kid who's working in the business thinks, hey, I should be entitled to the business because I'm the one who's worked here for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years. While that's being said, the other two siblings, the brothers and sisters, are saying, well, we don't care that you've worked there. Our father owned this business, and you know we should be entitled to two-thirds, one-third each. We don't care that you've worked there. So I think that family-owned businesses, I mean, need business succession planning even more than anything because a regular business without business succession planning, you can only lose the business. A family business without business succession planning, you can lose both the business and the relationship with the family. We've got a question from a participant in California, and he wants to know if it's advisable to use an asset protection attorney in his state because there's variations in state laws. Um, certainly, look, if you have someone in your state that's qualified and, and you're one of those people who want to be able to go meet with them in person and don't want to have to travel, then absolutely. The problem is, is that there might be a thousand personal injury attorneys in every city. There might be a thousand criminal attorneys in every city. There's very few asset protection attorneys. There's a lot of estate planning attorneys who claim they do asset protection, but that's really estate planning, which is totally, totally different than asset protection. You know, I found that there's really only about maybe five or ten, uh, you know, real big asset protection attorney law firms, you know, like ours around the country that really work with the majority of the clients. So my answer is there's absolutely nothing wrong with using an asset protection attorney in your state, but you really need to know how long have they been practicing asset protection? You know, how many asset protection cases do they do per day? You know, we might speak to four to eight uh, different asset protection clients from around the country every single day. If they're only speaking to, you know, four to eight a year, chances are they're more of an estate planning attorney. So certainly nothing wrong with it, but you just want to do your due diligence and qualify. All right, we've got someone who owns a home in Illinois but just closed on one in Sarasota, Florida, and is interested in the homestead exemption that you talked about in Florida. Any rules you can share? Sure. You know, unfortunately, the homestead in Florida – only applies if you are a Florida primary resident, which means you live here at least more than six months out of the year. So if that person truly lives in Illinois and they've bought in a Florida property, well, I'm going to guess that they're an Illinois resident, which means they could not qualify for Florida homestead protection. They could only qualify for Florida homestead protection if they're a Florida resident and they live here for more than six months out of the year. So with that being said, you would never want to put that property in your personal name for two reasons. Number one, if you get sued, somebody can take that property in Florida. Number two is if you rent that property out or even just to use it as a vacation home and have visitors, if somebody gets injured on the property, since you own it, somebody can sue you for everything that you have. So a good strategy for that client might be to put it in what I refer to as a domestic asset protection LLC. And that's just one of the many protective entities that we talked about uh, in one of our slides. Mm. In your experience, which business entity have you found to be the most protective? You know, again, uh, it depends on the asset. So, for example, if we're talking about real estate or businesses or boats, which, you know, I kind of refer to as, you know, dangerous assets, you know, those should be in some sort of form of a domestic asset protection LLC. 
Um, if we're talking liquid assets, which I refer to more as safe assets, well, that should be in the, you know, the protective entity like a domestic asset protection limited partnership. Um, if we're talking a lot of liquid assets, we might put it in some sort of international entity. So it's going to range on the asset. There's also no one-size-fits-all. You know, the client needs to feel comfortable, you know, with what they're doing. You know, sometimes you might get a client and their assets definitely warrant international asset protection. But if they're not comfortable with it, you know, there's no point of doing it. You know, the whole point of asset protection planning is to know that you can go to bed at night God forbid, uh, you know, something happens the next day, you know, you're not going to lose what you worked so hard for. And if your plan is going to keep you up because you're not comfortable, well, you shouldn't do anything in the first place. How does an LLC compare to an S-Corp? Well, there's a lot of different uh, type of comparisons that you could talk about. You know, S-Corps and LLCs both permit, uh, excuse me, pass-through taxation when properly structured and the proper tax forms are, of course, filed. Uh, but an LLC is more flexible um, in allocating income against the, amongst the members. Um, an LLC may offer several classes of interest, while an S-Corp may only have one class of stock. Uh, and the interest in a limited liability company, an LLC, you know, may be owned by any numbers of individuals or entities, whereas ownership in an S-Corp you know, is limited both in number and in entities. So, for example, you know, an S-Corp, if anyone has them, um, you, know, you really need to talk about changing that because the bad thing about an S-Corp is it needs to be owned by a U.S. individual, uh, a very special trust, or a single-member LLC, which is called a disregarded entity. And the reason we don't like S-Corps is that if you're sued personally, having nothing to do with the business, somebody can take your S-Corp and essentially take over the entire business. With an LLC, and again, depends, you know, if it's taxed at the partnership or, you know, passed through or how it's taxed, you know, an LLC can be owned by other entities. So an LLC will give you a lot more protection than an S-Corp. With that being said, if somebody just really wants to have that S-Corp tax status, well, no problem. You know, you can have an LLC taxed as an S-Corp, which kind of gives you the best of both worlds. You know, you have a lot better asset protection, and you still get the same tax advantages that you had with the original S-Corp. Uh, got a question about attorneys. Considering that two different attorneys are involved, what should come first, estate planning or asset protection planning? Really good question, and I get that question a lot. Uh, really, there's no right or wrong answer. You know, if you don't do your asset protection planning, well, when you pass away, you're going to have nothing to pass away uh, and no assets to pass on. Um, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to do your asset protection planning first. Um, the important thing is that you're doing both of them. So whether a client chooses to do asset protection planning first or whether a client chooses to do estate planning first doesn't really make a difference. Um, again, I, I always want to be as buttoned up as early as possible to make sure it's proactive because you could be doing your estate planning, God forbid you get in a car accident or you get sued, at that point it might be too late to do your asset protection planning. Um, but again, I, I don't think it makes a major difference as long as you have no litigation because you have to be proactive. You know, whether you decide to do your asset protection planning first, your estate planning first, you know, either one is fine. The most important thing is that you combine the two. So for example, you know, whenever I do an asset protection plan, you know, I'm calling the client's estate planning attorney, the client's financial advisor, uh, the client's insurance uh, salesman. We want to make sure that everything's not done, you know, alone on an island and that everything is commingled. So for example, you know, we talked about uh, putting a piece of property in an LLC or taking liquid assets and putting them in a limited partnership. Well, those are asset protection techniques. Maybe what we do is we then combine it with their estate planning. So let's say they have a trust. Well, maybe we make the trust the owner of the LLC. Maybe we make the trust one of the partners of the limited partnership. So regardless of what they decide to do first, the most important part is that all their professionals are talking and that everything is combined so that everything is not alone on their own island. A, so one participant lives in a state far away from Florida and wants to know about consulting with you. Do you have attorneys in any other cities from your firm? We do. We do. We're a boutique practice. You know, we do absolutely nothing but asset protection all day. Um, and we have about seven or eight attorneys. Um, and we have a nationwide practice, so we'd be happy to speak with anyone. You know, if you had a question, we can have a complimentary uh, preliminary consultation. And, you know, we have attorneys that are licensed in different states. So certainly we'd be happy to help them and, you know, have a call and see if we were the right fit. You know, I think, you know, the most important thing is, you know, before you even get into, you know, helping a client plan, you know, number one is what is that 
client want to accomplish and can we help them? And number two, we want to make sure it's the right personality fit. But, but certainly, yeah, we would be happy to assist them. Um, by that same token, if somebody thinks of a question as soon as we end this webinar, can they call your toll-free number you've got up on that slide or email sure. you? And Sure. What I'd also be happy to do, again, as a Vistage member, um, if anybody calls us or sends us an email, um, I'm happy to give them our complimentary copies uh, of our latest books on asset protection. So even if they just want uh, more education and they're not ready to move forward with anything, absolutely no problem. They can call us. Uh, they can email us. Um, and I have no problem you know, sending them complimentary copies of the books. Great. That's very generous. Thanks, Hillel. One final question in summary. What is the best way to protect our assets? <laughs> you know, again, you know, asset protection really shouldn't be cookie cutter. You know, there's no one size fits all plan. Uh, everybody has different personal assets. Everybody has different business assets. Everybody has different potential threats, creditors, and liabilities. You know, one guy might be worried about a third or a marriage. Uh, you know, the other person might be worried about their, you know, teenage uh, uh, kids driving their cars. So, uh, again, you, you need to find that individualized and customized and tailored plan, you know, that works for you. You, you can't do any cookie cutter planning. Well, hello. Thank you so much. Again, this has just been very interesting, important, and eye opening. And we appreciate your time and your expertise. It's my pleasure, and I appreciate you having me. And I hope that the information was educational and valuable and timely. Great, great. Well, remember, Hillel wants to come to your message group, so be sure and tell your chair about him. And next week, next Friday, March 20th, at the same time, we are going to have another Fridays with Vistage webinar, backed by popular demand, how operationally focused companies become market leaders. And this is part two, and if you didn't hear it the first time, there's going to be a recap, so don't worry about this. But the session after the recap will really delve deeper into strategy. Now, the expert is Art Saxby, and he runs the country's largest strategic growth implementation company. I was in on that webinar, too, and I remember it being very interesting. It sounds kind of dry, like a dry title, but it was fascinating about how being operationally focused can really help you become the top of your game. Well, for all of us here at Vistage, I'm Lori Allen. Thanks for participating today, and have a happy and healthy weekend. Thank <laughs> you.